shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send for Good morning. Thanks for joining me. I'm Dave Grant, and I hope you'll get your Bible up so you can follow along with me. We're looking at the topic of judging, and last week we started with the idea that David, King David, um, from the Old Testament, um, saw that God was the one to make the judgment. Uh, he had an opportunity to, to kill his enemy, and he said, no, God chose him to be king. So God will have to take him out. And from that, I realized that in our lives, a lot of time we don't show the respect for the judgment that God has reserved for himself. It's not my place to tell you that you're lost or you're saved. I teach what the Bible teaches, and you have to make it right with God. I, I would be happy to assist. I can facilitate. We can study. But the key is, the ultimate decision of whether or not you're right with God is between you and God. So we're going to look a little bit deeper as we conclude this topic on judgment. We've only got a few more lessons left in this uh, study of David, the shepherd king. Um, it's a phenomenal study, and I've learned a lot going through it again. I've known about David and Goliath since I was a little boy. But the key is, is the older we get and the more we study, God reveals even more to us. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn to a passage, what we're going to be looking at today is judging ourselves and judging others. Um, I want to turn to Matthew 7. Uh, Matthew 7 is a Jesus Sermon on the Mount. I'm sure you've heard of that. It begins with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. So if you turn to Matthew, in fact, I'm already there. Matthew 7. We're going to, we're going to start with the first seven or first five verses. Uh, we may read a little more, but I think that's all we're going to get out of this particular passage on judgment. It says in verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I want to break this up, so I'm going to stop there for a moment. Um, if you're in the business of telling others that they're right or wrong, judging others, whatever judgment you use, whatever standard you use in making that judgment, will be the standard God will use for you. That's what Jesus is saying. So if you're a real liberal in your judgment, um, and you go around telling people you're going to hell, guess what? You don't have the right to say that. And so God can use that same judgment against you. Um, he's told us to be merciful because he is merciful. So let's be careful about judging. And then it, it says, uh, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Uh, in the market in those days, uh, you could still find this in some uh, of the Whole Food stores or um, the co-ops. But they actually measure out the grain or the flour that you're going to buy. Well, is that scale accurate? Now, in the United States, they have a little stamp on the pumps at the gas station that says that this has been tested and uh, it is verified that it is accurate, one gallon. Um, if you go to the store, it measures of the uh, Food and Drug Administration, I think it would be, or the USDA. 
verifies that everything weighs what it's supposed to weigh. But if you go to an open market, especially in the times of Jesus, and the guy has calibrated the scale so it says a pound, but it's really only three quarters of a pound, then he's cheating you. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if you shortchange, God is going to see that you receive the same kind of payment. Then we'll go on. Verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye when but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye or how can you say to your brother let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye you hypocrite first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye that's pretty common sense, isn't it? Now, he used a... Sometimes Jesus' examples go over the top to make sure we understand the point. If I have something in my eye and I can't see clearly, well then, um, someone might want to help me and, and identify it and find it and remove that speck from my eye so I'll be able to see clearly. But if some guy comes along and he's he's got... Uh, well, let's just say he's blind. He's got a log in his eye to the point where he can't even see. Why would he think he could take the speck out of my eye? Let's make that real. If you have had nothing but trouble in relationships, why would you counsel someone who's having trouble in their relationship? Unless you first take the log that is out of in your own eye so you can help someone remove the speck that is in their eye. In other words, are we so righteous that we can make judgments and think that we can tell people what's wrong with their lives? Let God's word guide and direct. We're not in the judging business. We're not in the uh, picking people apart business. And so, you know, on Sunday morning, I'll, I'll preach at the Escanaba Church. And uh, kind of like on TV, I, I just tell it like it is. I, I'm not polished in the way that I tell you something so that you don't know that I just judged you. <laughs> that I just have to say it right out. If you're living this way, and I point out where in the Bible it says it's wrong to do this, and I say, if you're living that way, then you're going against what God has taught. Now, that might offend you, but I wouldn't be the hypocrite because I have taken God's judgment rather than my own. I am asked many times, well, is it wrong to do this? And I'll just tell what the Bible teaches. So we have to be careful that in judging we judge ourselves first to make sure that the standard we're using is correct. If I'm using the standard of what I think is right and wrong, then I'm not correct. But if I use God's standard, then yes, I'm using righteous judgment. So I got to first judge myself. What standard am I using to judge myself? Now, I have another passage I'd like to look at. And it's in John chapter 7, just a few pages over, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in John chapter 7, Jesus again is teaching. But this is, a, this is an interesting uh, passage, and I think it applies. It's in verse 23 and 24 of chapter 7. Verses 23 and 24 of chapter 7. And the humidity is high again. So I'm having trouble with my thin little pages in my Bible. It, uh, it also is difficult to sleep at night when the humidity is aside. Okay, now this particular uh, context is uh, Jesus has healed a man on the Sabbath. Now in the Jewish law, the seventh day was holy to the Lord. 
And he said, you shall do no work on the Sabbath. Now, in that Old Testament context, that's what Jesus lived in. Don't forget that. Jesus didn't live in the New Testament. He didn't live under the New Covenant. He lived under the Old Covenant. And yet he healed a man on the Sabbath. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees and all the religious people would kind of make up the rules of how to live as to what was considered work and what wasn't considered work, how far you could travel, how far you couldn't travel, the different things you could do on the Sabbath. Because God said, the Sabbath is holy. You shall do no work on the Sabbath. Now, he wasn't very specific, was he? He just said, is it holy? And so the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the priests, they would circumcise a baby on the seventh day if it fell on the Sabbath so that they would be obeying the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, because a child had to be circumcised on the seventh day. Or on the, oh boy, and seventh or eighth day. And if you can remember, but we've got to check that out. Um, I believe it's on the eighth day he was uh, circumcised. But if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath, they would have him circumcised. So the priest is doing some sort of work, but they consider it righteous work because it's obeying the law. And Jesus said in 23, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Um, in one of the older versions of the English language Bible, it said, but judge with righteous judgment. In other words, Jesus was saying that this was not breaking the Sabbath by healing a man and making him whole. And so it's, it's important that we realize that what we think sometimes someone may be doing may actually be something else entirely. The motives of a man's heart cannot be discerned by us. So if someone is doing something good for someone and they're late for church as a result of it, are we going to judge them that well, they're late again? Don't they think the Lord is special enough to be here on time? And yet they had been spending some time trying to help someone who had broken down and gone in a ditch. You see my point? Don't judge by mere appearances and don't be quick to judge. But first judge where you're coming from. Are you making righteous, correct judgments? And what standard are you using? Now, I want to share with you, and I, I'm not sure that I have enough time, but let's take a look. It's uh, 12 minutes into the show. Um, I've only got 28 minutes. So let's, let's try one more. Amos. It's my favorite story. Right? One of my favorite stories in the Bible. You may want to go to the table of contents because Amos isn't very big. And uh, it's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And when I look in my uh, ESV Bible that I send out free of charge here on the program, it's 908. It's just a lot easier sometimes to go to the table of contents. I could find all of them because I know, well, the minor prophets are all there together. So I just start going through and I have memorized the names, but sometimes it's, it takes longer to go through the song of what I memorized than by going to the table of contents. I think what we want is utilitarian um, Bible study. We want to be able to do it and understand where we're going. Amos was a prophet. He was a shepherd before he became a prophet. And he might have been a shepherd while he was prophet. But the key is, God called him into service. And he lived in the Jerusalem area, uh, Tekoa. And he was, like David, a shepherd boy. 
and he grew up shepherding sheep. When God's message came to him, he was to go to Jerusalem and tell the people what God had said. Now, this is one of the things, uh, it's Amos 7, 7 and 8. Take a look at verse 7. Um, well, look at verse 1. This is what the Lord God showed me. He showed him several different um, images so he could better understand it. This is what the Lord showed me in verse 7. Verse 7. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line. With a plumb line in his hand. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Get that image in your head. He sees a vision of the Lord, God Almighty, standing behind a, a wall holding a plumb line. Now, if you don't know what a plumb line is, Google it. Because it, it would be like a string. And on the bottom, a weight is tied to that string. So that the weight keeps the string straight. There's... Gravity is not going to lie to you. It's not going to be crooked. It's going to be straight up and down. That's how they measured to make sure the wall was straight. Now, you're going to make some conclusions there when we look at what is the standard God uses to measure that wall. I want to stop there for just a moment. I, I need to get a drink and um, rest my voice for just a moment. And while I'm doing that, you're going to see some images on the screen for our Bible course, our Bible, with the addresses that you can write to, to get any of those materials free of charge. I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, get your Bible back out and look at Amos 7, because we stopped with the idea that God is measuring a wall. Measuring isn't the right word. Um, he's deciding whether it's straight, true. Remember, the plumb line will be exactly straight up and down. And so that plumb line is put against the, the wall as they build it to make sure they keep it straight. And so we looked at verse 7 where that's what Amos sees in his vision, is God standing behind the wall holding a plumb line. Verse 8 says, And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and will rise against, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now, Amos has to go and tell the people this. What has he just said? God is making judgment, and the plumb line represents his righteous judgment. Are they living according to his word? Are they following his law? Are they keeping his Sabbath? And he has pronounced judgment based on, in the latter part of 8 and 9, against the house of Israel. What judgment is he using? What's his standard? Well, the plumb line represents the word of God, the law of God, and the people aren't obeying it. And so the prophet is told, go and warn the people. I am going to punish you. The punishment, you can see it in different words. Never again will I pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. A high place is a place where they went up to worship other gods high places they would and you can see this in archaeology there many nations had high places in which they would offer sacrifices to whatever god they were worshiping and the sanctuaries of israel will be laid waste they were not worshiping the way god wanted them to worship they may not have been keeping the sabbath and so he's going to lay them waste that his judgment based on his word, based on his law, and what he has told them he needs they need to do. So can I learn from that? I can. But first the plumb line needs to be in my own life. 
I need to judge myself and not be in the business of trying to judge others. So the plumb line, when I put it into my life, I say, oh, I need to work on this. I need to get more in line with the word of God. And one of the things about our study with David is David wasn't perfect. The plumb line was swaying in the life of David many times. But he knew how to come to God and confess his sins and repent of his sins and ask God for forgiveness. I learned from that. And so I asked God to guide me and correct me and cleanse me and keep that plumb line secure in my life so that I'm always in his word following what he wants me to do. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Whatever he does prospers, as the leaf does not wither. I really think David has given me some insight in my own life. So Amos, when he brings out the plumb line, or God does, that makes it real clear to me. I need to focus on getting my life right before God and straight and true so my walls stand secure. Now, after I have gotten myself right with God, that doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. So every time the, the plumb line gets a little out of whack in my life, need to get it lined up again. And that's an ongoing process, trust me. Can I help others? Yes, because the same plumb line that I'm using to keep my own life in line, I can offer to others and share what God has said in his word is righteous. And so I make judgments Based on what God has revealed, I tell people, this is what he wants us to do. This is what he needs us to do. And then you get to use that plumb line in your life to bring your life in order again. There are so many people that are willing to help with that because they've been working on this for years, getting their life in line. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but it means they will be willing to help you get started plumb line in your life. One of my favorite passages, as you can see, I get very passionate about it. So ultimately, judgment depends on whether or not we are in a position to share what God's judgment is. Look at Romans chapter 14 with me for just a moment. I don't want to get hung up on a lot of cultural things that are no longer in our world. And that's what Romans 14 tends to be using as examples. But I want you to see that the Apostle Paul in the New Testament is basically telling us the same thing as Jesus. Take the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of somebody else's eye. Get your life right. Not perfect. But you know where to go to be true. And that is the word of God. So in Romans 14, there was some problems in the church where people were judging each other. It still happens today. It really does. But we keep preaching. We keep teaching in hopes that people will get a, a handle on this. And we'll quit judging by mere appearances. In Romans 14, let me just start by reading the first uh, four verses. And then we'll talk about that until we run out of time. Verse 1 of Romans 14 says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything. One person, while the weak person, eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? 
It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, I have to warn you, if you read into the rest of it, you'll see a lot of wonderful things. But the examples, like the eating meat, eating vegetables, the examples have a context of that culture in that time period. This is first century. In the first century, the marketplace sold meat that was offered to idols. So if a, uh, a cow, a steer, a lamb was sacrificed on the idol to a, a god Zeus or the god Baal, God would not be pleased. But that was the culture of that day. Everybody was doing it. Except Christians. Christians were not. They worshipped only God. But if they went to the marketplace and bought that meat, they ate it, and they had, they didn't have a problem because they didn't believe in Zeus or Baal, and they didn't think the gods meant anything at all. So the meat wasn't defiled to them, so they ate it. But younger Christians, brand new Christians, saw the idol, saw the meat, and said, we can't eat that meat. That's been offered to an idol. And so their conscience wouldn't allow them to eat it, and so they only ate vegetables. Now, they're both in the same church. How are we going to resolve this issue? And Paul indicates right in the very beginning, don't quarrel over opinions. And if you will continue to read, because I think I'm running close to being out of time, if you continue to read in Romans 14, he said, an idol is nothing. It doesn't mean a thing. So he's actually telling the weaker brother, the one who has the weak faith, it's okay to eat it, but don't eat it if it offends your conscience. If you think it's wrong, don't, don't do it. But since an idol is nothing, and it means nothing, and to a Christian there's only God, then there's nothing wrong with the meat. So he's actually teaching the stronger that it's okay to eat that meat. But he's telling the weaker, it's not okay for you to eat if it bothers you. But don't be judging the man who doesn't see a problem. You know, that takes away a lot of judgment in the church, doesn't it? It takes a lot of judgment away from everything we do. Is we don't all have to see eye to eye on everything. We have to learn to respect each other's opinions. Now, do I think baptism and the forgiveness of sins is an opinion? No, I think there are some things that are quite clear in the Bible, and Paul does not waver on them. He doesn't say, well, it's okay and it's not okay. You know, he doesn't say both are right. He says, you need to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So I'm not going to waver on that one. If someone is not willing to obey that command from Jesus, the apostles, and all through the early church, and the recorded word, well then, all I could say is that's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible says, whoever is not baptized will not be saved. As you can hear, I just lost all my time, and I can't shut it off. I hope this has been helpful. Don't hesitate to call if you have a question, a concern, or you want to figure out a way to get into a Bible study. Thanks for being with me, and God bless. Yeah.